As uh, many of you know, I'm Catherine Prescott, a chief curator here at Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center, and my co-host is Mary Celsus Ottomanelli, board member at the Hendrick I. Lott House. And tonight for Taproom Tastings, we are talking all things dairy. Um, and as Mary said, as people were joining, uh, if you heard it, uh, we kind of went in slightly different directions, um, went down a couple of different rabbit holes. Uh, there is a surprising lot about dairy um, out there. Uh, and it was very easy to get sidetracked, I would say. It was It was more exciting than I thought it was going to be because you think of dairy and you're like, okay, well, how does it influence food culture in the United States and even on the East Coast? And then we had mentioned Al Capone's like touch in, uh, into the dairy industry because his sister dies of uh, contaminated milk. And he's the reason we have like expiration dates on labels now. And you're like, okay, well, Al Capone is part of this. New York City had a really big dairy industry, mob related as well. Um, and then we like picked out a few of our favorite recipes and it was just a very big hodgepodge. Um, I don't know where to, we could probably start at the time, like, timeline wise of do we want to start with the universe or do we want to start with Columbus I, I think we can uh start with the universe yeah um dairy in the milky way yeah um so dairy is or milk uh in general is kind of one of the uh first things that really develops in uh human um the human diet in the agricultural revolution in the Neolithic age. Um, humans differ from other mammals in that we drink the milk of other mammals, um, but also that many of us continue to drink milk uh, after we're weaned. Um, so most mammals, once they're done, um, once they're weaned, they're not drinking any other milk. So, um, and this milk consumption kind of has, ended up in a lot of the mythology in around the world. Um, so Mary, you want to tell us about the Milky Way? I have never felt more like a fourth grader trying to read through NASA's website. Um, big words were very challenging this day. Um, but I was, you know, I was doing my typical Google search when I kind of start these things and I went, oh, oh yeah, we live in the Milky Way. Like, where does that come from? Um, Milk was a very important symbol in mythology, going back to the Sumerians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Romans. The Fulani of West Africa believed that the world started with a single drop of milk. You'll see the theme consistently. There was the Greek mythology origin story that the goddess Hera, who sprayed milk across the sky, thus creating the Milky Way. According to ancient Greeks, when Zeus's wife Hera was breastfeeding Hercules, the muscular infant was suckling so brutally that the mother milk got spilled all across the velvety black sky, thusly producing, it's not even like the, it's just the size that we see today, which I think is very interesting in the fact that everything kind of always, there's a root in milk that I didn't realize goes back this far. Um, and then we can skip it. Well, the ancient Romans also, I really loved, literally means the, the road of milk when you talk about the galaxy, which I thought was really cool. And then I went onto NASA's website. I put up a really fun fact. Um, not at all terrifying that we're going and living in the universe like this. I always get a little crazy when I have to think about it. But um, yeah, you look at photos of the universe and you're like, I understand as somebody who is not as knowledgeable as NASA with things like the Hubble telescope of why you would think that the origin of the universe developed with the concept of a droplet of milk. Um, it is very beautiful though. I will say I did look at a bunch of photos and kind of go through their slideshows and I was like, yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah, so um, we can see milk has been really important in, in a lot of different cultures. Um, and I kind of, in, the the beginning of this research um, went down the road about uh, genetics and lactose tolerance um, because I was very interested in that um, because 
one of the things is that most mammals, once they grow up, become lactose intolerant. They cannot actually um, continue to, to drink milk um, of any kind, but there are a lot of people in the world who are still as adults lactose tolerant uh, and can drink uh, milk uh, and eat other dairy products with lactose in it. Um, and that is because of a mutation and so <laughs> genetic mutation. Um, but what I discovered in that is that um, large scale dairying kind of began around six to 7,000 years ago, um, dairying of cattle. So before that it was like goats and sheep and, and some cows, uh, but really kind of the large scale uh, began uh, six to 7,000 years ago, uh, mostly in Eastern Europe, though it did develop independently in other parts of the world as well, um, but mostly in Eastern Europe in the Balkans, and then it kind of spread across the European continent. Um, and it's at these higher latitudes that it developed and probably because of the shorter growing season. And so you need another food source because you can't depend on crops. Um, and milk provides protein, sugars, um, a lot of the different vitamins you need, um, cow milk. So uh, these people started to drink the milk and uh, eat it through butter and cheese. And somehow there was this mutation that was advantageous. And so it spread. And genetics actually show us that for people with European heritage, if you are lactose tolerant, you likely have this one particular gene mutation. And so pretty much all of Europe uh, has this one mutation. Um, whereas in places like Africa, where cattle farming and dairy kind of developed individually, um, they have at least four different mutations likely more, um, that allow them to be lactose tolerant, um, which I thought was really interesting that all of your, we've got one, um, but surprisingly there are also cultures that have a big, you know, are, are very closely related to dairy that are still lactose intolerant, um, up in the Mongolian steppes, uh, they're, milk plays a huge part in their food culture, but genetically they don't have that mutation, um, which is really interesting. And one of the papers I read suggested that it's probably because they actually ferment their milk products. And so there's no lactose in it by the time they're, they're consuming it. Um, whereas in, in Western culture, we don't really ferment except for yogurt. Um, and then cheese as well. Uh, but we generally consume our dairy with lactose in it. Um, so it was, you know, I, I didn't realize I was going to get into the biology bit of it, but I thought that was really interesting about how, you know, we are, we've kind of, this is one of the really easy ways to see how like survival of the fittest almost affects our genetics just so interesting because I was when we talk about these things I always kind of look back to the Greek part of my background and I'll look at my husband's Italian part and and how each ingredient that we're looking at each month plays into our lives and stuff and I was like well how Greeks eat a lot of dairy like tzatziki is a big thing in my house and we love yogurt and I'll switch out milk with yogurt if I'm baking for like a fluffy or muffin but it's interesting to see the, the learning about the scientific DNA switch of it while learning that, that like diets still maintain themselves in that dairy based living. And everybody just kind of goes, we're not like one of the Greek dishes is Saganaki, which is basically like deep fried cheese and it's delicious, but it hurts my tummy. <laughs> and sometimes you just don't want to learn your lesson. Like a cream cheese, incredible. The vegan version is not as good. I know they've made leaps and bounds, but it's not as good. Um, <clears throat> vegan butter is okay. Mm. 
the vegetarian in me has like tried all the things. I was telling Catherine earlier, I was like any kind of like alternative dairy product, I will absolutely try. Um, don't knock them till you try them. I will say that, but it's it's definitely interesting to see the like DNA makeup of people mixed in with what we're willing to tolerate and not take out of our diets because we don't want to. Like human will versus like science. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of foods I think humans have uh, just continued to eat through our bodies telling us this probably isn't the best thing for you. All, all the peppers and things like that. So dairy is one of those those types of, of things. I mean, that just goes into, I mean, we're thinking of dairy that we can consume now that just gives us a tummy ache. But when we're looking at it historically, and I think we both kind of touched upon this, especially in New York City history of New York City led the way in a lot of dairy and food reform in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, the Unfortunately, one of the things that I had to look at a lot when I was doing research for this was the high rate of children's death in the 1830s and 40s due to contaminated milk because it, it just wasn't pasteurized. It was being um, sourced out um, in very disgusting, really gross environments. It was called swill milk. Um, and there's a whole entire clean milk movement. So when you think about clean food today, it's kind of along the same lines. Um, let me pull up my slides because I was able to find Oh no, where is it? Uh -huh. um, just a lot of advertisements and journalism around the concept of milking, uh, swill milk. So on top of having access to clean water, which was very limited in New York City, another important beverage was access to milk. Um, and that was used for young children drinking it to uh, recipes and just kind of everything in between. So <laughs> Swill milk is produced because brewers and dairymen were locating their dairies next to the distillery manufacturers, and they were feeding the cows the waste from the distillery's fermentation process, which was that um, swill grain mash that's left over. So that's what the cows were eating. So already what they were producing was already malnutritioned, really yucky stuff. Um, in order to boost sales, the, the swill would actually come out really thin and blue, which is really, really gross when you have to think about it. And what they were doing was they were adding in water for volume, chalk for coloring, and then molasses for sweetness, and then on occasion, egg for creaminess. Um, and they were realizing that a lot of kids were still dying. And this was on top of, this was on top of things like cholera outbreak. Um, cows were dying at a very large rate rate at this point because they were also just not being tended to so you can see this is the um milking the kite the cow milking the dry cow very literally on its last breath they would milk the cow even after it had died and then chop it up and send it to the butcher to be sold for meat um and the children's death rates because they were ingesting this and it was normally the poorer people because the rich folk would have access to clean cows who would probably be on their farm or they would move uptown and have access to cleaner farms that didn't have cows living in this environment. Um, in 1843, before the epidemic hit the swill stables, the city inspector of New York reported that children under five years of age represented nearly 4,500 of the 13,000 deaths in the city. So it's a very large percentage um, and that's under five years old when already the birth rate and the survival rate are low to begin with in the 1830s in New York City. In 1856, so about a decade later, 13,373 children under the age of five died, while the number of deaths of people over the age of five had kind of maintained that 13,000 number. Um, by the 1840s, children under five had represented roughly a third of all of the deaths in New York City. And then by the 1850s, they represented more than 60% of all of the deaths. So this is a very, it's a bad percentage. And I say that as somebody who has a five-year-old and the concept of like actively not knowing how to give them clean food is terrifying. Um, so this moves into kind of New York City's first push towards what I would consider like a food activism in the progressive era. Um, you have these journalists and you have these 
wealthy mothers essentially coming in and saying, why are all of these children dying? And they would go into these stalls at the breweries or into the pastures and realize how terrible the conditions were. So you can see one of the first ones was Frank Leslie's Illustrated. He led the kind of movement towards that clean milk. So he went in with a bunch of his reporters, strangely enough, conspiracy theory number time, uh, conspiracy theory number one, uh, one of his reporters went in there and he ended up dying and they didn't see him again. Um, so that was very suspicious, but the dairy industry was very lucrative. It was very powerful in New York City. They had the city council in the palm of their hands because they were bringing in the most amount of money and boosting the economy. So the choice of changing laws to like make clean milk or not ruin the economy to New York City, when I'm going to say it, New York City is based on the economy. So it didn't change at first. There were a few different people. So Frank Leslie was the first. Um, and then Robert and partly because the temperance movement got hold of this as social activism as well. And they stepped in. And I think I have more slides as well. So this is another thing. So they would pretend that they were using pure country milk, but they were taking it um, from the swill milk that was created in those market areas, lying to people. And then they'd be like, well, I'm out of it. Um, they started looking into all of this stuff and it just became this huge 20 year process. Um, eventually by the 1840s, 1850s, the rules did start changing. They weren't heavily enforced, which is unfortunate. Um, the New York City is that the problem was people still wanted access to milk, but they weren't willing to go out of their way into the countryside because there's no refrigeration. So that's the key to it, right? So you can only be so close to a farm. Um, at one point in time, they opened up excuse me, a creamery in Central Park area to kind of offset the spoilage of milk it would take to get from the cows coming from Brooklyn, or they would start literally transporting cows from Brooklyn to Manhattan to get fresh milk, and that surprisingly didn't work. Um, it didn't really set in until about the early 1900s, so you're looking at swill milk from the 1930s, 1830s, 1840s until the early 1900s. Um, yeah, so when we talk about like stomach aches from your milk. We're talking about like clean pasture, right? Um, but these are just a few of the advertisements that I was able to find. Let's see. I found this one. So this is again, like government is in the pocket of the creamery, creamery and other distilleries of what they're willing to take. And I love a good cow joke. Um, but I think that's all the ones that I have. And then we, when we talk about butter, I've got also butter stuff too. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I was also, um, I went on a little kind of side trip on was the health and safety laws that came about often of, all bad. Or around milk um, and, and other dairy products. And um I did end up reading this article. They, these two constitutional law historians um, were going back over all these cases surrounding health and safety um, and milk and uh, kind of trying to argue that the progressive era in, in this in this one particular area was less progressive, at least in the judicial system. Um, and there was a lot of overturning of legislation that was deemed unconstitutional at this time. Um, and because I think, because milk and dairy products just had such a big part of American culture at the time that in both the econ in the sense of the economy, but also in our food culture and, um, and, you know, every people's livelihoods that it just became this really contentious topic. Um, and I did not understand most of this article. It was a lot of heavy legalese. It was like 70 pages long. And they also had like oh, no. a 10 page appendix just listing court cases. Um, so I don't know, Mary and I were talking, maybe we'll do something about the FDA um, in a future, future episode of taproom tasting. So maybe I'll get that out again and we'll We'll work through it. 
We'll get a constitutional lawyer to look at it for you yeah. and tell us what it means. It'll be fine. Yeah. But I do think it is fascinating that milk consumption has been part of, you know, the kind of Anglo-American culture for so long, considering mm -hmm. how many ways it can go terribly bad. Uh, because you do have to be very careful with milk. It spoils very quickly. Um, and the, you know, the illnesses you can get from spoiled milk are, um, you know, very yeah. grave. Um, and there's a lot of diseases that can pass from cows to humans. Um, so like all of this kind of brings back to, to focus like how it's intricate and nuanced at the same time yeah. yeah there was a lot to unpack when I was looking at a lot of the epidemics and also how it plays in today because I was reading an article from like the early 1900s of cows getting mastitis and like giving antibiotics and how people organic foods and like that I didn't even I that that was a different tap room tastings for a different time but that was like it's very like you think you're going to read about one thing and then it it circles into opening up 16 new tabs to talk about or like look up something else. Yeah. Um, but I did kind of it did um, make me more interested in how in the 18th century when they didn't have any knowledge of germ theory or bacteria and you know, biotics of any sort, really, um, that they managed to develop in America, this huge dairy industry, um, and how it just became such a huge part of the, the culture and not have a lot of these issues um, until you really industrialize, right? Um, and so that sent me on a little bit about reading some of the um the different like how-to books that were published um in the 18th century about like how to you know raise a cow or run a dairy or make cheese and things like that um and there are some interesting things um so women generally in anglo-american um society women handled dairy so the men took care of the cows, like the animal husbandry part, but the dairy stuff, it was all done by women because they knew they had to keep it spotless. It had to be really clean and men were just too dirty. Um, so, so that's why women did it. <laughs> um, but also a lot of um, these pamphlets warned that it should be like the farmer's wife or their daughter you don't want to leave dairying to the servants. Um, the quote was, it's too ticklish a business to be trusted to servants. Um, so they they knew that this was like, you know, you had to be careful with it, right? And the, the dairy was very specific. It was usually attached to the cattle shed um, and uh, cows were milked at least twice, sometimes three times a day. Um, and they could give up to, um, or at least two gallons a day, although the maximum is about eight gallons in the 18th century. Um, the, the one article I read did do the calculations at 40 weeks of milking per year. Uh, the average cow gave a, just under 5,000 pounds of milk, um, which is at, which is actually, not too far off the average produced by a uh, modern shorthorn cow. Um, so interesting. That, yeah, because they do point out cows in the 18th century were smaller uh, than modern dairy cows, uh, mm -hmm. but they produced a similar amount of milk. Um, and interesting. Uh, it was also interesting early in the colonial period when you have a bunch of different um, nations kind of settling in different parts of North America, um, where American cows came from, where American dairy cows came from. Um, there was a, an interesting article I read. So the current cattle heritage is in the different regions of the US generally reflect where the cows came from. So like in the Southeast, uh, the cows 
generally um, are of Spanish origin. They're not great milkers. They're smaller. Um, and uh, in the North West, so the Wisconsin area, they're French cows. They came out of French Canada. Um, they were brought over that way. Uh, but in New England, we have Dutch and English cows. Um, so the Dutch brought their cows over to New York, uh, the English to Massachusetts. So here in Connecticut, we get a bit of both. Um, <laughs> but one of the Normal. things I, I really found very funny is the Dutch cows were known to be better milkers. Uh, but they required more care. They were a little bit finicky. Um, and so the English <laughs> cows were deemed to be better suited to the American colonies because they were supposedly sturdier, even though um, they didn't produce quite as much milk. Uh, but there was some, um, I think he was probably a Dutch travel writer um, who kind of, pointed out the fact that he thought the English colonists just didn't want to change their husbandry practices. Uh, and so they were, they felt like they could just deal with the English cows and they didn't have to take care of them as much as they did the Dutch cows. I was going to um, say who wrote that because it sounds like it's an English bias. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was a Dutch guy. He's like, they're not going to like change their ways to, to get better milk. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was kind of early, uh, early cows in in the colonies, um, and then uh, kind of moving on. I said cow the, the cow the average cow gave at least two gallons, but a maximum of eight gallons of milk a day. That is a lot of milk to try and keep. Um, and so, obviously, the best way to preserve milk is either in the form of butter. Or in the form of cheese. Um, Delicious. Yeah. Uh, yes. So that's kind of the direction I went, right? Um, <laughs> and so I did, excuse me, um, look at butter production uh, and lots of different butter, um, butter churns. Uh, so the way you make butter is you just agitate cream um, until the milk fats and the solids all bunch together. And that that's what the butter is. And then you have the butter milk um, off of that uh, that you can pour off and uh, use in other ways. Um, and so there's different styles. I, you're probably most, most people are most familiar with the, the churn style um, butter churn, uh, the, the tall, um, one with the stick that you lift up and down, um, like but the one behind you. Yes. This side. <laughs> um, but there's a bunch of different kinds of butter churns, uh, the middle one and this, um, the other in the top left are paddle butter churns. So the, the crank turns these paddles that agitate the cream. Um, we actually have examples of both of these in Keeler Tavern's collection as well. Um, they're both missing the paddles though. I guess they're the most easily broken part of it. Um, and then uh, there's also the barrel style, which looks, it looks to me, it reminds me of, um, a cement mixer because you'd literally yeah. the thing would just tumble around and that's how you would make barrel is going right yeah um, wow and you could do it the vertical way as in the the auction photo um or in the painting you could do it horizontally um and the the in the painting there may or may not be paddles inside i can't tell um, and then the two churns on the bottom, I saw when I was looking through auction photos of butter churns, um, and they just fascinate me. So you have one, uh, the one on the left that is a rocker butter churn. So you would rock it back and forth. Um, and then you also have the swing butter churn, which is actually probably the oldest style butter churn. So they've found in, um, in the Levant in Israel, um, kind of these ceramic 
uh, butter churns that would be hung up. They kind of look, they're almost bullet shaped and they swing back and forth. Um, but they just fascinate me, all the different ways people chose to make butter, um, invented all the ways to make butter. So um, yeah, butter was probably the easiest way to, to preserve your, um, your milk. Uh, and it was, uh, I think two gallons of milk has enough fat to make one pound of butter. So, um, it's a, it's a way to use up, uh, your butter pretty quickly, uh, your milk pretty quickly. And then, uh, the other way is cheese. Um, cheese takes a little longer. It's a little more complicated, uh, but it also keeps longer than even butter. Uh, so, and most of the cheeses made in the 18th century were hard cheeses. Um, you know, all sorts of, of different types. Um, and uh, here in New England, a lot of the cheese um, making heritage came out of the uh, southwest of England. Um, so that's the kind of cheese that was made here, those, those styles of cheese. Um, but I've included a couple of recipes that were in uh, recipe books from the 18th century. So these are both from um, Hannah Glass's The Art of Cookery uh, from 1775, this edition. So this is slip coat cheese and brick bat cheese. Uh, these are slightly softer. They're uh, easier. Slip coat is like very soft cheese. Um, uh, more like a cottage che cottage cheese esque, um, I think, or maybe a cream cheese esque kind of cheese. Um, and then I just like the brick bat cheese. It must be made in the month of September. Um, can't make it in October. Can't make it in August. Apparently. Um, and then here we have rules. Uh, a cheese press. Um, and all of this stuff, as I said, would be done by the women of the, the farm. Um, and uh, then the question is, what do you do with all of this stuff? What do you do with all of the cheese? Um, Listen, bread and cheese is a staple in my house. Yeah. That's all you need sometimes. <laughs> um, so I did get into the economics of it a little bit. And uh, so um, actually a lot of the butter and cheese produced in New England, especially, but in all the colonies was exported um, to the Caribbean, mostly. Uh, oh, okay. So in the 18th century, uh, the European powers had colonies in you know, continental North America, but also in the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, all of that land had to be set aside for sugar, um, sugar production. So they weren't going to set aside any land to pasture cows. Um, and so instead, they got all of the cheese and butter they needed from the continental colonies. Um, so uh, I had the number, it was uh, in the years 1768 to 1772, so just before the Revolutionary War, about 1 million pounds of butter and cheese were exported to the Caribbean colony, the British uh, Caribbean. Um, so yeah, that is a lot of cheese. However, that was uh, only twice that was sent into the coastal trade, so to the big coastal cities. Um, in North America, so places like Charleston and Savannah um, and, and down into Florida. Uh, Philadelphia was the largest butter exporter and Newport, Rhode Island and New London, Connecticut were the largest cheese exporters at this period just before um, the revolution. Uh, of course, after the revolution began, uh, trade to Brit other British colonies was stopped. Uh, however, the French then came said, you can send it our way. Uh, and so we we switched to sending it to the French Caribbean ports. Um, but after the war, not much trade to European um, ports, uh, except during the Napoleonic era. 
because when the Napoleonic Wars were happening, they were too busy fighting each other to deal with that. And so, so America stepped in to, to bring that. And then the other thing I found super interesting is that uh, in 1794, uh, trade of dairy products to China starts showing up. Uh, in 1794, uh, 5% of American dairy exports went to China, which means, I mean, that is a long way because you have to go down around South America and then come back up. Um, so their preservation techniques were must have been very good. I was gonna say, like, I get the trip to West Indies. Like, a, I can, I can see that trip. But my mom made a China with yeah. cheese. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, yeah, and the cheese, I think, hard cheeses they last for quite a while. That I can understand. It's the butter that I mean, cause yeah, butter. You know, it keeps longer than milk, but it's not. Um, and so I did. Wonder if it was being wrapped better. Yeah. In a way that like a sugar would have been wrapped, maybe. One of the things that I did um, find out is how they preserve butter. Um, wow. You can see, so these are, this is from The Art of Cookery and then also American Cookery by Amelia Simons. Um, how to choose when you're marketing, how to, how to buy your butter and cheese. Uh, but in this particular um, edition of uh, the art of cookery that I found online. It has this handwritten uh, receipt to preserve butter, um, and it's it's basically just a ton of salt. Um, so it's take two parts of the best common salt, one part sugar and one part saltpeter, beat them up together. Take one pound, one ounce of this composition for every pound of butter. Work it in well. Uh, into the mass and um and then that's how you it, it'll hold for one month it says um and then one of the things that it is noted is that before you use the butter you have to wash it out right you want to yes. wash out all of this salt and, and the salt peter specifically um so now i'm interested in this trade yeah. Because now, I, now I'm like, what were they trading for, right? Because we showed up with butter, and what, what good was coming back? We should do a whole peppermint on Chinese. Absolutely. Now yeah. I need to know. But there has to be some letter that's at least one voyage was like the butter didn't make, it. The cheese didn't make. It. Yeah. Um. So the other thing that was interesting is looking at these, like how to pick the right, the good butter and the good cheese at the market, right? Um, and Amelia Simmons is a lot more, she provides a lot more detail about this um, and different things like, you know, new pine tubs are ruinous to butter and to have sweet butter, you know, you have to uh, procure it in May and things like that. Um, which I thought was really interesting. Whereas Hannah Glass is just like, when you buy butter, don't don't taste the outside, try the middle. That's it. <laughs> um, and if cheese has which holes is, in it, it probably has maggots in it. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Which is so interesting because I was trying to figure out the process to get milk from Brooklyn, which is where most of the, the farms were to Manhattan at the time and there were these huge contraptions to kind of keep it fresh and one of them had like a cement like barrel situation to keep air they we were trying to keep it airtight and they were trying to keep it from spilling or getting over too heated to like congeal and I'm thinking of this process and we're I mean we're looking at today a 45 minute process from the lot house to like a downtown New York situation by train by like 2024 standards but I'm thinking a couple of hours we're looking at like a day's journey and then we're looking at preservation techniques to get us like across an ocean or literally across the and I'm like and then you realize how late in the game refrigeration happened 
and you're like, but why didn't it happen? Like, I can't say anything because I don't understand science. Like, I know that the fridge works. We're good. Like, I'm a history person. I'm grateful that it exists. But, you know, sometimes you look at these people and you're like, why? Why didn't we push for this sooner? Yeah. But it is interesting that we were exporting so much cheese. Um, I was looking into New York's role and Little Falls, New York, turns out, had the first cheese market in the United States in the 1860s. And this was a pretty big deal because instead of people going around to the smaller places and the smaller, I keep wanting to say distilleries, the, the creameries, same thing almost, right? It's kind of, um, everybody would go to this open uh, cheese market on Mondays and it was in the Mohawk Valley. So it was one of those like central location in upstate I would say upstate New York, I may get yelled at for this. I'm so sorry. Um, but uh, it was such a dominant industry in that area um, that this like train station became so famous. It's also noted um, Dr. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. His body came down on that rail track as well. And everybody waved and was like trying to offer him cheese. And I was like, we're, we're taking it too far now. <laughs> um, let me pull up some of these. Because I was able to find... And it's always what I love about doing these is I always get to poke around a lot of the local um, historical societies, which always have like the best fun things. So this was James Willett. James Williams founded the first cheese factory in the United States in Rome, New York in 1851. Um, he was a local, where's his little bio? He was a farmer as well as his father. And he basically, it's kind of like Bob's um, grain mills that it's a employee owned business. So he was able to start it that way, which I thought was really cool. Um, and I wasn't able, unfortunately, because not everything has been digitized. I couldn't find any of the cheese that they were producing, like the kinds of cheeses. And so I, I always wondered, if they were still basing themselves off of those 18th and early 19th century cookbooks, right? Like how, how has the recipe of cheese changed in the concept of like pasteurization and knowing it could last a little bit longer and where it can go from there. So I haven't been able to find those, but I did, I found a picture of him and I found a picture of the factory, which I thought was really cool. And then the cheese market was open on Monday and it was an open air one. And the, uh, market accompanied dairymen. They were able to set the pricing for the day, which was really important. So it wasn't too much haggling, which made it a really good space. Um, and the dairymen would come into the village with their wagons laden with butter and cheeses and would line up along the avenues of all the, uh, the streets of Albany and Anne. And then they were all within proximity to the railway station. So I think I have a picture of the cheese market. I was able to find that. Um, the amount of cheese that they were producing is absolutely bonkers. Uh, that is a that is a million point six. That is so much cheese in the 1880s. Um, and they were, it was just happening. So you can still go to Little Falls today. I think they're on their fifth or sixth anniversary of like a cheese fair. It's huge. They get, there's like 150, 200 vendors or something like that. And they expect so much uh, business. And I mean, like my exposure to a cheese market is basically like the dairy aisle at Trader Joe's. Um, it's, it's fine. But when I was looking up the statistics, again, I couldn't even find the recipes for the cheese, cheeses that were being produced at this cheese market, which I thought I would be like almost kind of on. Um, but I was also able to find that in 1860, a nearly 11 million pounds of cheese were sold and shipped out of Little Falls. On a single day in 1866, over 380,000 pounds of Permacar County cheese were delivered to the railway station. Um, and then by 1871, that production grew more than six times to 68 million pounds, which also included exports to England. Um, it's so much cheese. Um, but I, I, yeah, it's just, it's just so much. Um, the Little Falls Historical, Historical Society Museum is where I got all of this from. They have a little cheese exhibition. I'm not still, I'm not sure if it's still on display, but they do have a webpage. 
and it breaks out so much more. So if anybody is interested in this, I do highly suggest checking out their website. It was super, super informative. They had a breakdown of all of the big cheeses, if I may. We haven't made a single pun tonight. Um, of all of those big cheese producers and companies and how they got into it. And it's a lot of local businesses who were family run for generations and kind of took advantage of the fact that the railway was right there and technology was changing and packaging was changing. And but they could come together and they owned, they bought the Evans Hotel, which is now the Evans House. I didn't get them to let me use it without the watermark. I'm so sorry. Um, but please check out their website. It's a, it's a very cute exhibition digitally. And you can see that they have um, pieces inside. So if anybody has a chance to go to the I would like to go and check out the cheese exhibition um, where they would have all of their meetings and they would have their big board meetings and talk about cheese and the role they were playing in the New York City economy, essentially, which is really, really cool. And I didn't expect to have like such an excitement about cheese. But here we are. Um, yeah. New York City crushed it. We're still like one of the top five producers of dairy, which I didn't realize. Um, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you've spoken a little bit about New York, so I suppose I should... Uh, Talk about Connecticut <laughs> a little bit. Um, Connecticut is has has always been a, a fairly large dairy um, producing state. Uh, had a little bit of a dip in the years after the American Revolution when um, most of our dairy farmers went to the Western Reserve, um, which is now in Ohio, mm -hmm. um, and that's just because there's more land there that is easier to have a lot of cows on. Um, so oh, these are, I'll get to these, but here is my, um, map of Connecticut dairies. Uh, this is not all of them. This is just what showed up when I typed into Google maps, Connecticut dairy farm, um, according to, uh, ctdairy.org, there are, um, 90 dairy farms as of 2000 of 2020, there are 90 dairy farms um, and over 19,000 dairy cows um, in the state of Connecticut. Um, so that is our Connecticut Moo IQ, <laughs> which I love. Um, it's adorable. So Connecticut does have, have quite the uh, uh, dairy heritage. And around here, there's, there's a handful of um, dairy farms uh, and a lot of them, Connecticut is actually known now um, for the ice creameries that are usually attached to these dairy farms. So there's really good ice cream um, that comes from the, these places. Um, and for the most part, dairy has been really successful here in Connecticut. Um, obviously, at, in the colonial period, it was a lot of small um, time things. Most family farms had at least one or two cows. Um, but once you got into the 1800s, uh, you started to see more farms specializing, uh, and you, you know, people would move strictly into dairy versus crop, um, farming. And so it rose in the late, uh, especially in the late 1800s when you have better transportation, um, so the trains, better roadways, um, expanded markets, as cities are growing, they're losing um, their, uh, what would have been the, the farms right on the, the edges of the cities. Um, but then by the mid 1900s, 1950s, once we start getting refrigerated train cars and trucks and highways make it easier to get um, dairy, fresh dairy out of the Midwest um, to the East Coast, uh, you start to see a decline in a number of farms. And so here in Connecticut, you see a lot of them kind of uh, coming together and, and merging um, and, until we have our, our 90 farms of today. Um, so, but Richfield itself was not really a big dairy town. Um, I couldn't find any uh, information about any sort of industrialized dairy here um, in Ridgefield. We had other things going for us. So, um, 
But uh, I did, as always, go into our um, our ledgers to see what Timothy was up to. Uh, and he was trading in dairy products. Um, so you can see this. Uh, we have a couple of ledgers here on the left side are the credits. So these are people who are purchasing from Timothy's store. Um, and here we have uh, three gallons of milk uh, that were purchased. This is the only instance I've seen of milk being traded, like milk as milk. Um, everything else is butter and cheese. Uh, so you can see he's also got three and a half, three quarters pounds butter. Um, in 1809, you've got someone else. Isaac Lewis is also purchasing three quarters of a pound of butter. Um, he also got some other butter um, uh, as well. And then a lot of the dairy that we find in the ledgers are people who are um, paying off their, their debts with it. So they, this is the, um, this is the credit side there, exchanging butter for, or cheese for things that they are purchasing in the store. Um, so in 1789, Elias Lee, basically that's all he's using to pay for his goods here at um, the, the Keeler Dachi Olmsted store. So he's got butter and cheese uh, here. So um, you can see like, four pounds of butter, 18 pounds of cheese, 16 pounds of butter. Um, it's like crazy. Um, and here, 1791, you also see uh, butter being exchanged. So my next question was, what is Timothy doing with all of the butter and cheese? And I did find half an answer. Um, and that is he was taking it to New York City to pay off his suppliers um at least to the cheese i found so this on the left is a um bill of sale for goods that timothy bought from isaac and andrew coke in um in new york uh for he got all sorts of things brandy sugar tea and what he used to pay for it was cheese um so yeah. he's got six cheeses and two cheeses and seven cheeses. I, I'm assuming they're different types of cheese because they're different, they're worth different amounts. Uh, and then the other thing I found uh, is that one of the things that Timothy was supplying in his store were milk pans, which I believe are the pans that you use, um, that they would use to uh, let cream settle out from uh, or rise up out of the um, the milk. Uh, so you would right. pour the milk in it and it would, the cream is lighter, it would rise to the top and you scrape it off. Um, actually behind me on the right-hand side, I have, we it's called a milk keeler. Um, and uh, it's basically just a short little pan there. Um, and so Timothy was selling milk pans, uh, which he bought from Jonathan Durrell. Uh, and then I did find there was one gentleman uh, who bought two milk pans um, about a year apart. I don't know what he was doing. They seem to last a pretty long time. So I don't know why he needed so many. Maybe he needed, he had extra cows or something. He needed more. Um, this was good, Catherine. Yeah, <laughs> so a lot of- That's all. But again, That's it's all kind of small time things I think you know these are individual farmers who have um you know maybe one or two or maybe a couple of more cows um but uh cows don't disappear after the colonial period after the revolution um in uh 1860 I think 1861 to 1881 uh the uh Ridgefield Agricultural Society held an annual agricultural fair and cattle show. Um, and we have a couple of the programs. And so inside they would have these like um, lists of the different types of competitions and you'd have best milk cow and best milk cow that's over three years old or whatever. Um, and also like they would judge your 
agricultural field. So they had like best wheat field over one acre and best wheat field under one acre, um, things like that. So that ran for, for a little bit um, here. So there, that kind of tells us there were still cattle around um, Ridgefield into the late 19th century. Um, and then on the right-hand side, I literally found this last week, um, a week ago, Monday, in a drawer. I almost sucked it up with a vacuum cleaner because we were cleaning out a drawer that had other stuff in it. Um, but this is a receipt from Mrs. Cass Gilbert, um, who, so she, they were owning, they own the house in the 20th century. Uh, this is from 1942 and she's purchased milk. Um, unfortunately, the, the, um, grocer's name is not got ripped off the top. Um, but here you can see she's bought some quarts of grade A milk um, and also several half pints of heavy cream. Um, so I Did she that buy was, 52 or 18? I'm not quite sure. Um, either way, both are quite a lot. lot. Um, so uh, I thought that that discovery was very timely. Uh, here so oh my goodness um, wow i will show the the cows of the lot house as my like little last one they, so the lots had a very large farm and they had cows roaming around um cows are very smart i absolutely love going to petting zoos with my five-year-old because i love hanging out with cats uh so this one was very fun for me to learn about how we actually take care of the cows now. Um, it's very sad to see all of those uh, propaganda and activism, progressive journals. But I just, I look at the house now and I look at the very suburban-esque situation in Marine Park. And then I look at these photos of the chicken coops and the barns and the cows and the pastures and even the, the competition-sized tennis court that they had at one point. And I'm like, is so cool that this existed and it makes us want to have things like chickens and, and goats and I, I don't think we can swing a cow in marine park but it's the thought that counts but I love the fact that we do have this photo so it's just the cows of the lot house and this was early night uh early 1910s so the lot slowly started to downgrade their farm as they realized that southern Brooklyn was going to start getting uh popular with the uh with crowds and they were going to start building houses and street grids and they were going to get things like electricity and indoor plumbing in the next decade and all the things happened but it is a it's it's strange to think of Brooklyn as a very agricultural playground um, especially when you see things like cows when you hold up a photograph and just see an entire row of houses now but you get a picture of cows. <laughs> I just have to show them we have graphs and stuff um we are at 7 30. I do my last thing that I do want to say since we are talking about cheese and dairy because I am Greek when you buy feta buy it with the brine and keep it in the brine do not buy dry feta cheese I see this all the time in the grocery store it's not going to keep it's not going to taste good just keep it just keep it in the brine I promise it's a full game changer I promise even if it turns a little bit yellow it'll be fine it's, it's good just take my word for it more. Have the cheese. Have the fat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so Mary and I have just skimmed the surface of cheese oh dairy God. history. Um, had to get it in. Uh and but if anyone has Literally. any last questions, um just stick them in the chat. And I did want to um share just one thing. It is the night before. Valentine's Day. So I thought I would share some 18th century dairy-based desserts. Um, we've got two. And uh, so the first one is a syllabub, uh, syllabub, which is basically like a whipped cream uh, treated with an acid, usually citrus juice, and mixed with wine. Um, and when you put them in the serving glass, they separate out. And so you get this like double layer um, thing here. So you can see in this painting, uh, you can see they've got some whipped syllabubs in the, the back right in the center. Um, and there's a couple of different kinds um, of syllabub, but generally you'd use like a nice, either a white wine or a red wine, and you get that um, separation there. 
Uh, and then the next one um, is a little bit, uh, probably more to our taste. It's called an orange fool. Um, it's basically an orange custard, um, but you've got uh, oranges and eggs well beaten into a pint of cream um, with a quarter pound of sugar, a little cinnamon and nutmeg. Um, and so the, the name fool comes from the French uh, Foule, which means like to press or crush. So you can make this, they had recipes for all sorts of different fruit fools, um, raspberries, strawberries, gooseberries, um, and the fruit is like pressed and crushed. Um, if you kind of follow historical food ways at all, several years ago, Townsend did a video on Orange Fool. Um, James Townsend did a video on Orange Fool um, and it kind of blew up for the wrong reasons on, on um, the internet uh, because a certain segment of the American internet thought he was talking about the president at the time. Um, yeah. Oh. So, uh, but no, he was talking about this particular dessert um, which actually looked really good. Uh, so uh, I think I might whip one up at some point. Um, maybe not oranges, not a fan of oranges, but raspberries or strawberries would be. <laughs> um, so yeah, thought I'd share a couple of uh, dairy-based desserts uh, that you might be inspired by for Valentine's Day. I love that you just went like full whipped cream. <laughs> You just went full like heavy cream. You were like, let's dairy this up. Let's yeah. go for it. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. It's like most recipes didn't call for milk. It's cream. Like, I, I don't know that they did much with the actual milk part of the milk in the 18th century. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we've gone a little bit over, but thank you all for joining us uh, for our talk on dairy. And we will be back next month um March 12th March 12th uh and we will be talking about the history of restaurants uh so we'll be we'll be going into to restaurants um and see how they they came about um so hope you'll join we'll us fine. Then. uh we'll <laughs> see you next month uh and enjoy the rest of your evening stay warm uh and stay We're cozy, make a syllabub. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Have a good evening, everyone.